Hey guys, welcome back to Beginner's Guide to Restoring Early Two Base Black and White Televisions. This time around, we are going to be talking about AGC and the video IF amps and video detection and DC restoration and a video amp. All right, AGC, that's an easy one. This set doesn't use it. I will talk about it, but this set in particular does not use it. It has manual gain, so automatic gain control, meaning you automatically adjust the gain of the set to maintain a constant video output level consistent screen brightness and contrast this set it's manual it's not that unusual for very early TVs to be all manual video IF those are the amplification stages after the tuner to increase the amplitude of the video signal detection turns it from intermediate frequency AM modulation to actual composite video the DC restoration well, we'll talk about that later. It's not that simple to explain. And the video amp simply takes a detected video signal and makes it a lot bigger. All right. Automatic gain control. Very similar to automatic volume control like you'd find in a radio. Doesn't really apply when you're feeding a direct signal via cable from a modern signal source. I'm talking about receiving something over the air where the received signal strength is going to vary depending on weather conditions, a cloud goes by, a time of day. You want to have a consistent image on your set. You don't want the brightness to be fading in and out of the screen size or the contrast levels. You want a consistent video output level. So how can you do that? The only thing to keep in mind is the video is AM modulated. And it's not 100% modulated. If it was, what does that mean? That means you're varying the carrier strength based on your video image. Now, if it was 100% modulated, imagine if you have a dark scene, you'd have no carrier. And then if the scene got really bright, you'd have a really strong carrier. Now, they don't go quite, I don't know, I don't remember the exact percentage, but let's say it's 30%. That means you're always going to have some carrier present. It's just going to vary about a certain amount. So a very simple way to do automatic gain control is you sample this. You put it through a low pass filter, meaning you take your output of your video amplifier where you have nice strong composite video signal and you just throw it into a circuit like that and this goes off and you use this to bias the grids on your IF or RF stages. That's a little naive approach, but it, it works okay. Why is it? All right, so why do I say this is a naive approach? It's because you don't want to base your gain on the average of the scene brightness. It could be a nighttime scene. And you don't want to artificially boost the gain to make it brighter than it's supposed to be. Likewise, it could be a very bright outdoor scene. You don't want to decrease the gain to make the image dark. Ideally, you want to sample some part of the received signal that is supposed to be a fixed signal level. Luckily, we have that. That concept is called gated AGC, and it came out a few years after this set was... Uh, produce, but I want to talk about it because it became the predominant way to do it. So I'm leaving something out of this video signal representation here, which is the sync pulse. So let me draw a little simplification of what a composite signal looks like. So let's say we have our horizontal sync pulse, and then we're going to have some video, then another horizontal sync pulse, and then some video, and a sync pulse. Well, let's throw in an axis here. 
let's just call this zero volts, these tips, these negative most tips, I'm simplifying this again, but this is the concept, these will always be minus one volt. If your output signal, the output of a certain stage in this amplifier, is where it's supposed to be. This video information can be all over the place. It could be here, here, here. But this, this is always going to be at this level. So what do you do with a gated AGC? You just sample this. You sample the negative voltage. And you ignore everything in between. And you adjust the gain automatically so that these negative most tips are minus one volt. Which will correspondingly make this whatever it's supposed to be, just inherently. This set doesn't do that. That set doesn't have any automatic anything. This set is manual, which is not that unusual for very early sets. Only the early RCA sets had uh, AGC either. But that's the smart way to do it. That's the solid, reliable way to do it. All right, what does this set do? Well, remember, there's a selenium rectifier in this set. And I haven't talked about it yet. I'll show it down here. They take the 6.3 volt filament supply and they rectify it with, back, with the diode oriented so they get negative voltage. It produces about negative 8 volts. And that goes right to the contrast control. And the wiper on the contrast control goes right to the grid of the RF amp. So, again, let's simplify things here. They have a minus 8 volt supply uh, going to a uh, potentiometer and that goes to the RF stage and several of the IF stages and that sets the bias, the gain on these stages so you rotating that contrast knob sets a fixed gain on this set. Now for us feeding in strong consistent signal sources from an over-the-air converter box, it's fantastic for us. Back then as your sing signal strength varied, might not have been the greatest viewing experience. I don't know, I wasn't around. <laughs> By the time I started restoring these, uh, I just barely had a chance to receive any signals before they converted everything to digital. So I'm not sure what the real experience was like. Imagine if you're in a strong signal area in a major city, it wasn't that big a deal, but uh, I could definitely see it being a bit of an issue, because obviously they they added AGC to every set shortly thereafter. This, <laughs> this They modified these designs. But that's how this set works. That's why that selenium rectifier is in there, is instead of sampling the output and generating an AGC voltage, we have this. We have this. All right, let's talk about IF briefly. Intermediate frequency. This set uses around 22 megahertz. What does that mean? It means it takes the received signal coming in, be it 72 megahertz or 208 megahertz, depending on what channel you're receiving. It down converts whatever you're receiving to something centered around 22 to 25 megahertz. And they have four amplifying stages. So we have our tuner and the output of that goes to oops, one, two, three, four stages of IF, which is pretty good. Later on they go to three or even two Partly because the tubes came out that had more gain, partly because they just, well, they just dropped off a, a stage or two to save money. And they either use 6AU6 or 6AG5, those are pentodes, that are designed such that when you vary the grid voltage, it nicely varies the gain on them. It's stagger-tuned. I talked about that extensively a while ago in a TV alignment series. What does that mean? It means each one of these stages is peaked to a different frequency. Your, your goal in this video, IF, it's not like an AM radio where you want to have a sharp peak or even an FM where it's slightly wide. It needs to be really wide. So you want your response curve to be something like that. 
around 4 megahertz wide. 4 or 4.5, they later shrunk it to 3-ish when color came out. Uh, to do that is really hard. In a, just a, a plain old tube circuit to get a pass band that's perfectly flat and has sharp edges that's four, 4 megahertz wide or so. So instead, they peak, say, this stage to that frequency, next stage to this frequency, and this frequency, and this frequency. Uh, I didn't draw that very well because they're not that well defined. Um, but it's, it's a very clever technique. It's more like one stage is this, one stage is this, one stage is this, and one stage is that. And when you add up the response of every stage, carefully tuned, this you get this plateau, nice wide flat plateau. A nice way to do it. That's what this set uses. Okay, we have to turn that intermediate frequency into a composite video. So after that fourth stage, we hit a diode. Let's see, let me get this oriented properly. It looks like they have it going this way. You can do it either way, it really depends on what comes after this. Because after this comes the video amp. And this uses two stages. And then the CRT. Polarity becomes important as you do this, depending on how many you know, odd or even stages, because each one of these stages inverts the signal. By the time you get to the CRT, whether you're going to modulate the grid or the cathode, you need to get your polarity right so that you're modulating it so bright is bright and dark is dark. And this it appears they do that way, and they use one half of a 6AL5 for that. Some sets uh, used solid state. By the time 1948 came around, there were early germanium diodes. Some sets started using those. Uh, but this set uses half, six, uh, six, one half of a 6AL5. And there's a little bit of filtering after that. But basically, yeah, the output of this goes right into 6AU6. Uh, first video amp and then a 6K6 final. By the time you get here and you're driving your CRT, you may want to have something like 50 volts peak to peak, so you need a pretty stiff signal. Having two stages helps us out though if you want to do something. I'm not a huge fan of this, but I totally understand why people do it because it produces a fantastic picture, which is you forget about your tuner, forget about your IF and you inject your composite signal. Directly from your VCR DVD player converter box and feed it directly into the grid of the first video amp. If you only had one stage of the video, this one volt peak to peak composite, which is the standard, might not be enough. You might need something like three, four, five volts at this point. But with two stages, one volt's probably enough. Might even be too much. You might want to attenuate this a little bit. Doing this will give you a phenomenal picture. You're turning your TV into a, a monitor. And the output of this goes to your sync circuits. So you get rock solid video, rock solid sync. Looks fantastic. But you're cheating because you're eliminating about a third of the tubes in the set. <laughs> and all the, the tuner and the IF and all that fun stuff. But if you really want to dazzle somebody with fantastic picture quality or really watch this TV every day, yeah, it's something you can do. It's something you can do. Uh, but that, that's, that's the gist of that, detecting it. Now, because I have this fancy new scope that appears 2465, which is a 350 or 300 megahertz bandwidth. We should be able, I've never really done this before, we should be able to look directly at the 22 megahertz IF in this set. With this in the most sensitive setting and whatnot. And we should be able to actually observe that AM modulated video signal. I'll try to set that up and see if we can. For sure we can look at the video AM. And we can see what happens when we adjust the contrast control. Now, there's one little issue with this setup.
is I left something out. I'm showing these connected with a line. They are not. They are not. They are capacitively coupled. That's a problem. That's a big problem. Why? We're losing our DC offset from the detector when we do that. Why does that matter? Well, let's go back to our, our little simulated video signal here. So I'm going to draw a couple simulated scenes. So let's have our sync pulse. And then imagine we have a very dark night scene with not a whole lot going on. And then we get another sync pulse. Not much going on. Now supposing it's a daytime scene, they put the camera up at the sky. We would get our sync pulse. And then the video would be way up here. And then come down to our sync pulse and then the video would be way up here. Now if we capacitively couple that to the stages, this relatively flat video signal, it's going to waver around. Whereas this should be bl dead black and this should be super bright white. We might get gray for either one of these because it's going to wander around when we go through these capacitors. We lose the DC. But just like I was talking about with AGC, what is consistent? What do we always know? That this is minus one volt or whatever it happens to be. So we, the video is changing, but the sync pulse is at the same level. So this set, as all the higher end sets back then, used DC restoration. They used the other half of the 6AL5 to form a clamp, a clamp circuit. They detect this voltage and they use a sample hold on it. They use the diodes that only conducts when the signal's negative and they charge up a capacitor. And they use a, right, a large enough value that it will stay stable for the length of this. And they reinsert the DC here and shift that signal. So it's locked on relative to the tips of the sync pulse. That gives you a real stable black level reference as the scene brightness changes. That's a really nice thing to have. If your set doesn't have it, things can look washed out. For very dynamic stuff, your typical honeymooners type show where they're indoor and the lighting's all kind of at the consistent level, not a big deal. When you look at outdoor stuff, nighttime stuff, it can, it can be annoying and you have to get up and adjust the brightness and the contrast to compensate. Ah, uh, one more thing, brightness control. Well, at this point we're combining the AC coupled video signal with a DC offset from our DC restorer. We can add yet a third DC offset here and have that go to, well, maybe this would be 100 volts or something like that, and this will be a brightness control. And this is simply going to add a DC offset to this point and shift the whole thing up or down to achieve a simple brightness control. I have my scope hooked up to pin 5, the plate of the fourth video amp. That is what feeds the detector. And that is the IF signal. Yeah, with this scope. So that is the actual carrier, the 22 megahertz or so carrier. Pretty neat to be able to see directly. Now, if I change the time base and start backing it off, that I do believe is a horizontal sync pulse. Keep going, and that will be a vertical sync pulse. So that's what it looks like going through the IF. So that is amplitude modulated with that carrier frequency. So let's look after the detector. We'll leave the time base right about here. And let's go. Now if you put the, the scope probe, say, right on the plate or cathode of the detector, you're going to swamp it. Even with the high impedance probe, it's still it messes with the circuitry, so 
You might want to go to the plate of the first video amp. So let me figure that out. I want to keep the scope settings the same if I can. Well, we should see two things. One, it's going to be larger, and two, it's mm -hmm, the carrier is going to be gone. So let's change your time base. And yeah, so if I increase the time base, it's just a little hint of the carrier left. Yeah, that, those are our sync pulses. See, that's what I mean about the, uh, the polarity, so our sync pulses are going up. Now, I mentioned about the contrast controlling gain. So, here I am adjusting the contrast control. So, going counterclockwise with the contrast, and we lose gain until it disappears entirely. Because why in the TV, if you put the contrast too low, you just, the picture just disappears. As you start increasing, and now we get good sync, and the picture looks all right. And if we keep going, it gets overdriven. And you start losing sync, and the picture gets distorted because we have too much gain. So your sweet spot is somewhere about here. And yeah, it's just a manual adjustment. That's the way it goes. If I look at different patterns on here, see the sync pulses stay the same, but we start seeing other stuff. gain some more. So this, so right now it's inverted so the sync pulses are up and the video is going down. So, so that's a staircase pattern. So on the, on the, that corresponds to gray bars on the screen left to right. It's a really common test pattern to use because you get nice bars on the screen. Now let's go back and see if we can look at this. Well, it's still unmodulated. So, to make it more sensitive. I figure I'm going to have a little bit of trouble sinking on that. I'm also AC coupling it a bit, but those are, <laughs> those are the bars. Yeah. Now let's look at the final output going to the CRT. And I got a correct myself about something before we do. There are several ways to do brightness and the way they did it in this set is not quite what I was illustrating. Here is the capacitively coupled video signal and this is the DC restoration coming in. Brightness they do separately. So they are modulating the video intensity but the grid they vary the bias on the cathode to set the brightness. That's yet another way to do it. Again, it has to do with the polarity and how they choose to design it. So they could potentially have taken this brightness and combined it at this node, but instead they're modulating a second element. It's not a bad idea because you don't want to introduce any... and then it might degrade the video signal, so it's probably why they did that. But that's what this 100K coming in here, that is restoring a DC offset after the capacitively coupled signal there. Well, something else to note, notice these coils here, 120 microhenry, 93 microhenry, a couple over here, those are peaking coils. Oops, sorry, there we go. Those help improve the video response. see some of them down here. I will 
there, one there. Those are fragile. They're often wrapped around the body of a resistor. Be very careful not to break those while you're recapping, soldering, probing around the area. If you do have a problem with your, your video output disappearing, it could be that one of those coils is open. In a pinch, you can short them out. You will lose bandwidth. You will lose some frequency response if you do, but you'll get something back, something watchable back. That's what those are. Why do they wind them, wind them around resistor forms? I think to dampen the Q of the coils. But oftentimes those resistors will also allow the signal to get through even if one of them is open. So sometimes your picture doesn't look so hot, but you have a picture. And it can be a real uh, head scratcher to figure out why. Check those resistances. There should be just a few ohms if they go open and maybe 10k, 20k, something like that. Because the resistor in parallel with the coils is still good in allowing some signal to get through. Uh, so finally, let's look at the output of the final video amp with the DC restoration. So that would be much, much, much larger signal. Yeah, I can see it's way off the screen on the scope. And that is what is actually going to the grid of the cathode ray tube. We're at 10 volts per division, so 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 volts peak to peak. That's the kind of signal level you need to, to drive the grid in a cathode ray tube. So when we're down at this point, it's completely cutting off. Well, that's with the, with the brightness and whatnot adjusted. That is your horizontal blanking signal. You don't want to see a, a streak across the screen when, this, when the beam is going from the right side back to the left. So the, the circuit is designed so that when you're way down here, the current is completely cut off. The CRT is completely cut off, so there'll be no illumination on the face of the CRT whatsoever. And that would be your black level, and then everything above that would show up on the screen. Now we got lucky with this set, and we didn't have to mess with any of the IF or video lamps. It just works pretty darn well. But if it didn't, if you didn't have any image, that would be where you'd want to start looking. Inject a signal into the second video amp. Just like a, an audio amplifier. If you don't have any sound, you inject a signal starting at the audio output stage and work your way back. The trouble can be what do you inject? Well, for the second and first video amp, you can inject a composite video signal. If you don't have a fancy uh, Suncor VG91 or some such, your 1 volt peak to peak out of anything that has composite video out should serve enough that you would see some indication of something on the screen. Now, the amplitude might be wrong, the polarity might be wrong, but if you hook up a 1 volt peak to peak composite on the grid of the second video amp, you would see something on the screen, some crazy bars or squiggles or something, which would let you know a signal's getting through. Now, if you need to go back before the video detector and it gets more complicated, then you will need a 22 megahertz AM modulated something. Now, if you took an RF amplifier and did 400 hertz AM modulation, and stuck it in there, you should get, again, something on the screen. It won't have the proper sync pulses, it won't be a, a proper video signal, but it will get through and it will get to your CRT and it will do something. Because remember, regardless of what signal is coming in here, your horizontal and vertical oscillators will keep running. So there are some really crude old school bar generators, pattern generators for TVs. Might have a couple tubes in them. This really, really simple crude circuitry with that concept in mind that your TV is going to keep doing its thing even if you don't provide the exact perfect composite video injection signal. But you can get some sort of pattern on the screen. So yeah, if you need to get back before the detector, Get a 22, 24, 25 megahertz AM modulated something 
and inject it on the grid of each stage until you get something on the screen. At that point, you know, the problem is upstream of wherever you're injecting the signal. Now, what do I have left to do with this? Well, we got lucky. None of this, this all works fine, so I don't need to mess with it. There could potentially be a problem working inside these IF cans up top. We'll talk about that in a future installment. But basically, this is ceramic mica down here. Spot check the resistors. Unless they're off by, I'd say, 50% or more, I wouldn't mess with them. And I didn't, and all these were close enough, I didn't bother. A couple caps left in here. I think that's an RF bypass cap. And that is for sound. Next installment, we're going to talk about sound. So we talked about AM modulated video in this installment. Next installment, we'll talk about FM modulated sound and how that IF works and how that is detected and amplified. And you finally hear it out of the speaker. So let's try it. I fired up my Hewlett Packard RF generator. Got internal AM modulation, 1 kilohertz. Uh, let's set a carrier frequency of 24 megahertz. We'll see about the signal amplitude, and I'm going to inject this into. Ooh, let's say second stage of the IF. So it's pin one is the grid on all the IF tubes, so we'll get a pin one. I clip my test lead to pin one the grid of the third IF tube, and I'm using a capacitor to block DC, so I don't want to damage my RF generator. Other side of that, my RF generator, I have a uh, terminating resistor between the ground and the signal. Not strictly necessary, but I use this for a lot of video testing stuff, so I just have that on there permanently. All right, so what did that do? Well, let's take a look at the screen. Look at that, we have bars. And how do I know it's my signal source? Well, I can disconnect it, and it's gone. So there we go, it's just an RF generator. And let's see, let's try different frequencies. I'll do one kilohertz, let's try 400. And we have fewer bars, lower frequency. So, if you don't have a pattern generator, all you have is an RF generator that is AM modulation. You can use that as a test signal source, and I can inject this at various points in the set. If I go forward one stage, so now I have less gain, it should be less distinct. In fact, we won't even see it. I can turn up the gain with the contrast, maybe, and uh, it's just barely there. But there's something. I could also increase the output level of my generator, so let's do that. And now we got the bars back. Well, if I go back a stage, now it should be a really strong signal. So much is making this kind of freak out. So, uh, there you go. You don't have to have special equipment if you she's your head a little bit and play around with the equipment you do have okay all that being said where's that put us where are we at well let's see i replaced the two filter caps for that negative eight volt bias but i did leave the original selenium in I'll leave that up to you. If it was a power rectifier, and be it a radio or TV, something that had a bunch of current going through it was the major power supply for the set, I would absolutely, without hesitation, replace it. I have one go up, essentially in my face, while I was trying to power up a set before recapping it. You don't ever want to experience that if you don't have to. It smells horrible. It's not exactly the safest thing to breathe either, and it will really stink up your home, and it took, I don't know, a few weeks for it to completely go away. Some of them might have been psychological, some of them might have been actual residue. It's nasty. Clouds of smoke will come out of some selenium compounds. It's nasty. That's why they get replaced. But also, as these age, 
they're not that efficient to begin with and as they age they get less and less and less efficient so we can check this, it's supposed to be minus 8 volts, this may be down to minus 5 volts because we've lost efficiency here however it has enough range that it is working it's flea power milliamps, maybe microamps of current so uh, yeah, I'll leave it up to you, if you want to replace it a 1N407 it's rated for 1 amp, 1000 volts vastly superior in specs to this guy it's kind of a universal replacement for seleniums. Other than that, I did finish recapping all the circuits we talked about now. In the IF up here, there are no paper caps. It's all ceramic, mica. But there is something lurking in there. I'm going to talk about it in the next video. I don't want to make this too long, but there's something lurking around inside these big transformer cans on top that you might want to take a look at. But down below there, there isn't much to deal with. There's one cap down here. It's probably a bypass cap on one of the supplies going to the IF. But ideally, you don't have to mess with any of this stuff. Resistors maybe have drifted a bit, but I'll tell you, you don't want to risk damaging anything up here. If a resistor is 20% high, I'd just leave it. I would just leave it at the set's base. So it looks pretty good, right, image wise. There were a few paper caps in the video amp, first and second. I replaced those. I spot checked the resistors around here. And generally they were close enough I didn't bother replacing them. Well, it's left uh, staring us in the face right here. There's a capacitor and a sound circuit. We're going to talk about sound in the next installment. I think we'll do this, talk about the sound IF and the FM sound. We talked about, we talked about AM modulation and detecting that in the video amp in this. The sound is FM. We'll talk about that in an upcoming segment. So what I'm going to do between now and then is replace these last two caps. And I still haven't replaced a couple electrolytics in the power supply, so I'm going to throw some adapter caps in there. But Otherwise, that is it for now. If you have any questions or want some clarifications, please leave a comment. Thanks for watching be talking about AGC, the video IF amplifiers, contrast.